Um, so our first speaker is going to be Philip Thomas, uh, who after studying systems engineering and physics at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, went on to found the San Francisco artificial intelligence startup Statoy, uh, which makes heavy use of the Julia language um, for the proprietary scheduling software. Um, Philip's talk will be on uh, using Julia for linear programming and solving optimization problems uh, with the jump package. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Philip Thomas, and today I'm going to be presenting about predictive analysis in Julia. So specifically, we're going to be looking at basics of optimization in Julia using the jump package. So we're going to be looking at four things today. First, we're going to start with just a basic introduction. Then we're going to cover the basics of optimization and operations research. Then we're going to talk a little bit about Julia and jump. And then finally, we'll look at some cool applications. So all the examples for this talk are on GitHub here. So I encourage you to check out that repo. I also link to the slides there. But what's pretty cool is that I set it up so that you can run a single command if you have Vagrant on your computer. And it will install all the dependencies that you need for running the examples. It will install Julia and uh, Jump and the different backend solvers that you need so that the code should just run in a virtual machine locally. If you have any questions, please uh, shoot us a tweet or our emails are on our website. And I'll post some follow-up from the meetup on our <coughs> blog there. But about me, I don't come from the academic world. I'm here representing the startup world tonight. Uh, <laughs> So like was mentioned, I graduated two years ago from Washington University in St. Louis, where I dual majored in systems engineering and physics and minored in electrical engineering. And then I came out to San Francisco to work in network security. And now I'm working on a startup called StaffJoy. And basically, StaffJoy solves the nurse scheduling problem from operations research as a service. And we're providing a way to automate ship scheduling, ship management, and just basic workforce scheduling for companies. And what's been really cool is we use Julia really extensively. Uh, so we run about 10 to 50 models per workforce. And we've had to do a lot of modifications in order to get it to speed up because the original formulations were taking hours or even days to run. So we've been able to get our models to run now in under a minute, which is really cool. So first, let's do a basic overview of optimization and operations research to make sure that we have the same vocabulary. So when we're talking about optimization in this context, we're looking to minimize or maximize an objective function to <coughs> constraints by varying decision variables. And so when you're defining these decision variables, you're looking mainly at three different types. They're either going to be binary, integers, or unconstrained floats. So this is just a basic example of what we mean when we're talking about uh, optimization. So you're trying, if you're trying to carry 99 cents, what is the lightest way to do that? Uh, this is a basic formulation where you're saying, well, here's the masses of every single type of coin, and we need there to be at least 99 cents when we add these up. And every, all these numbers have to be integers because they are, you can't create a fraction of a coin. And um, the final thing is that they're all going to be greater than zero because you can't carry negative coins. So we'll solve this problem later using jump, but this is just kind of what we're going to be talking about today. In terms of problem classification, the main buckets for different types of problems in optimization are going to be linear programming, integer programming, convex programming, and then you start to get into different types of nonlinear programming. Uh, the juliaopt.org website has a much better overview of different types of subproblems and how they would be solved. But these are kind of the basic ones that you should know. And as you start to get into different types of nonlinear problems, the time complexities just skyrocket, and the algorithms become a lot more specialized. But in general, when we're talking about linear and integer programming, those algorithms are pretty well flushed out. Simplex is actually extremely fast. So just to clarify, linear programming, you're going to have objective functions or constraints that are going to be pure linear with float type numbers. Uh, integer programming will just be the same thing, but you'll impose the constraint that the numbers are integers or binary. Convex programming is where you start to get into uh, time complexities that get really difficult to work with. So you can be talking about squaring or square rooting numbers. And then you can end up in a nonlinear world with uh, discontinuous solution sets and things like that become really difficult to program. So these are basically the types of problems we're going to be describing. And it's really important to understand the types of problems and how your problem fits into one of these buckets. Because when we're talking about jump soon, 
you have to be able to classify your problem in order to pick the type of solver that you want to use. So here's some basic uh, classic operations research problems. So operations research is more or less uh, optimization and other types of advanced analysis applied to business problems. So for instance, the knapsack problem is the coin carrying problem that we carry, trying to make selections based on different types of constraints that require an optimization. Routing problems is kind of like the Google Maps problem. How do you get from A to B while minimizing time or distance? Then there's other types of classic problems, like the traveling salesman problem, just something that like FedEx has to solve every day. You have a starting location that is also the ending location, different places you need to visit, and what is the shortest amount of distance that you need to travel in order to get between those. That's something that can be solved with Jump. And scheduling is another classic optimization problem. That's what we're solving at StaffJoy. So we're looking at taking a workforce and different types of demand and saying, how can we schedule people subject to these constraints? Like a part-time worker can only work 20 hours per week. They might not be available on Tuesdays, something like that. And then turning it into an optimization problem where you want to minimize the overall hour schedule because every hour of labor costs the business money. But there are also physics applications that are pretty interesting. Um, so <laughs> variational calculus is, by definition, uh, an optimization problem. But when I've looked into it, it seems that the best way to apply it to this type of optimization formulation is to use power series expansions because jump, things like that, don't handle hyperbolic cosines and stuff very well. If you do a power series expansion, it's a lot easier to fit into the types of solvers that jump has available, and that'll really improve the time complexity. Uh, so like one of the very specific examples in variational calculus there is Lagrangian mechanics. So you can figure out motion of particles based on an optimization. So we'll do one of those examples later. And then as you move forward, there's a lot of different examples. You can look at how particles repel and minimize their energy. And flow problems are also a very classic optimization problem. So those are some physics applications. We'll solve some later. So I'm the first speaker of the night, so I'll give a little bit longer of an explanation about why Julia is cool and talk more about Jump. Uh, so Julia is an open source scientific computing language. I like to think of it as a much easier to use version of MATLAB. It's also started to take over a lot of uh, projects that have been written previously in some of the Python-based math libraries. And in general, it works really well because it's compiled, but it's a just-in-time compiler, which means that it doesn't compile until you execute it. So it still has a feel like an interpreted language like Python. But then they have a lot of interesting features built in, like dynamic dispatch that bring huge speed gains because the language is able to dynamically adjust the types of calculations based on the data types of the inputs and variables. And other, what also makes it really nice is that there's a built-in package manager. Uh, this may seem minor, but when dealing with other languages like Go, the lack of that can be really frustrating. And Julia does a really nice job of making it easy to pull in all these different dependencies, which becomes really important in optimization when you have all kinds of different packages that you can <coughs> Finally, in the multi-core world, it does support parallel and distributed uh, computing. We don't really use that as much for Jump, because we'll talk about in a second, Jump tends to call C-based libraries that work separately. And in terms of how, Ju how Julia works, I didn't find it to be a very complex language. If you have experience with other languages, you should be able to go to this website and basically find uh, a review of the syntax. Uh, so LearnXNYMinutes.com has a whole page written in Julia. It walks through and says, this is how you make string, this is how you add numbers, this is how you do a for loop. And basically, you can avoid looking at most of the documentation if you just have this page open. So that would be my suggestion for how Julia works. So now Jump. Jump is uh, the main focus today. So we're going to be talking about applications of Jump. So Jump is Julia for mathematical programming, which is part of the Julia Opt uh, series of packages written by the Operations Research Department at MIT. And what it basically does is provides a high-level way to express optimization problems that then interface with low-level solvers that are really efficient at solving these problems. So if you go to the juliaopt.org website, it's a beautiful table which lists the different types of problems, like linear programming, integer programming, nonlinear programming, and then the different solvers that they have interfaces for. Uh, currently, version 0 0.8 was released, I believe, last week, and it did a great job of adding in a lot more support for nonlinear optimization. So, moving forward, if we keep an eye on that web page, I'm 
I hope that we'll be able to have more solvers available for different types of problems that will be more specialized. But here's why Jump is awesome, is that it's kind of the Rosetta Stone for optimization. So in the past, you either had to use something like Excel, which just doesn't interface well with scientific computing in order to handle optimization problems, or you had to find a very specific low-level solver and then write your optimization code in something like C. And neither of those is ideal for scientific computing. You can't uh, interface the code well if you're writing it in Excel. It's not very portable. But then if you're writing it in a low-level solver, you're spending a lot of extra time on things that really don't require your attention and effort. So what Jump does really nicely is it provides a really high-level way of expressing optimization problems that works really well. But then it allows you to swap in the solver in the back end, which is really cool. So that means that using the same type of extensible language, you can be solving linear programming problems. And then if you decide that your problem perhaps needs a convex constraint, rather than have to rewrite it into another specialized language for a different solver, you can just import a convex solver, drop it into Jump, and then add your constraints, and everything should work really nicely. So that's why Jump is cool. It's kind of the meta language for optimization. It's really easy to use. And then at the low level, it calls these C-based packages that in general are super fast and provide really robust optimization. So here's a brief intro to Jump. Uh, if you pull up the repo I have on GitHub, you can follow along. But in general, to use Jump, there's just some basic steps. You need to import it using a using statement. And then you need to instantiate a model. So you say m is equal to a model. And at this point, you have to specify which solver you want to use. So if you go to the Julia document, or the Jump documentation, they'll explain uh, how to call the different solvers that are available. But it's pretty straightforward. And what's really nice is that when you're instantiating this model, you have access to a lot of the lower level features of some of the solvers. So for instance, with CPC specifically, you can specify how many threads you want to use if you're on a multi-core machine. If you have custom heuristics that you want to use, it's fairly straightforward to drop in. You get access to a lot of those specialized features, even though you're not using the native API for some of these solvers. And then defining a variable, you notice that all of these statements begin with an at. That just means that you're using a Julia macro, which is how the jump designers chose to execute these functions. So basically, to create the variable x, if you want x to be an integer that's less than 0, you use a statement like this, where you're saying, on the model, I want to create the variable x. It's less than or equal to 0, and it's of type integer. Do the same thing here for variable y. And then constraints are very straightforward to add. So here we're adding a constraint that x minus 2y has to be equal to negative 2. Um, and then setting the objective is also straightforward. And then at the end, you basically call solve n. And if we wanted to change this program for a different type of solver, it'd be fairly straightforward. So if we wanted to change x and y to be uh, floats instead of integers, it'd be very straightforward to just go in, change the solver to a different solver like Garobi, and then swap these out. And everything would still translate really nicely. So let's look at some applications. Uh, so the very first example I up was what I would like to call the Macklemore problem. You're going to the thrift shop, you want to carry 99 cents, you want to do it in the lightest way possible. So this is on the GitHub repo that I published, but uh, it's actually fairly straightforward to do. So basically we go through and we say we want to use Jump. We're going to use a solver called CBC. CBC is open source. Jump supports both open source and commercial solvers. If you're working in academia, it's worth looking into the commercial solvers because a lot of times they provide better access to multi-core solving. And in commercial applications, you'd have to pay ridiculous licensing fees. But in academia, some programs like Urobi are available for free. And they do a really great job of solving. So I would suggest looking into that. But here we're using something called CBC, which is an open source solver out of the Coin Operations Research Foundation. And it's a branch and bound solver. So that's the type of algorithm it's going to be implementing for solving integer programming problems. But we basically create these variables. We say we need pennies, we need nickels, we need dimes, and we need quarters. And these need to be integers greater than or equal to zero. So these variables are going to, in the end, tell us how many of each type of coin we need to carry. And then we add the constraints that we need to carry at least 99 cents. So we basically multiply each variable times the value of the currency in cents. 
and we say that it needs to be greater than or equal to 99 cents. And then the objective, we say that on the model, we want to minimize this function, and so we want to minimize the mass, so we take the values from the US Mint, or the grams per coin, multiply it together, and then solve the model. So it's fairly straightforward, and we get a minimum mass of 22.68 grams. Uh, interestingly though, the lightest way to carry 99 cents is actually to carry one dollar. So that's a basic example. Let's do our final example here, which I think is a little bit more interesting, which is a catenary. So basically we want to figure out the shape that a hanging chain takes. And we're going to do this using optimization by minimizing the potential energy of the chain. So the, our basic strategy is we're going to define an x and y coordinate for every connection of links here. So basically we're going to have an x and y for the starting position, an x and y where these two chains meet, and then we're going to define all these different variables for the connections between these different chains, and then optimize those x and y variables in order to minimize the potential energy. So let's pull up the code here. So I adopt, or adapted this from the code I found from a professor at Princeton University. You can see his original code, which is in AMPLE. It's, uh, it's available online, but then this is also in the repo that I published. And so basically we're going to go through, we're going to import jump, and we're going to treat it as a nonlinear problem. So we're using another open source solver called IPOPT. And then we're also going to plot the points after we finish graphing it. So I'm importing a Julia graphing library called Gadfly. So basically we're going to say we have n number of chain links. So here we're going to say there's 100 individual links in this chain and we're going to connect them together. And basically we're going to define our starting and ending positions. So from the beginning of the chain to the end it's going to be an arbitrary unit of one. And then we're going to define the length of each link here as uh, based on them, the number of links that we created. So we instantiate the model, we say that we're going to use the IPOP solver, and then we define our decision variables. So it's worth pointing out that because we have 100 individual pieces of chain, that means we're going to need 101 x coordinates and 101 y coordinates because we're defining the left and right side of each one rather than the individual chain links. And then we're going to minimize the potential energy. Uh, so you notice that gravity doesn't really come into play because we can treat this as, we can treat this as unitless, so the specific gravity uh, constant doesn't matter here, so this would work on any planet, hypothetically. But uh, basically what we do is we are summing across the center of mass for every link, so we're assuming that the center of the link is its center of mass, and then we're summing its potential energy here. So we can use this sum macro here that's available in Julia which makes it quite straightforward to do this. So here we can say sum this for j is equal to 1 to n. So we zero index j, so note that we're starting not at 0 but at 1 so that we don't have an off by 1 error with the first variable. And then the next step is fairly straightforward. We anchor the ends, so we're starting x at x equals 0 and then x equal l at the other end. We're fixing the height at an arbitrary number zero there so that the starting and ending position of the chain are at the same height. And then we define some starting variables, uh, some starting values for the variables. This becomes a lot more important to set starting values when you're dealing with nonlinear optimizations because it will significantly speed up the algorithms if you have a starting value that's reasonably close to the final value. And this is where a lot of heuristics can come into play. So this is where you can create interesting heuristics to try to speed up models. And then basically we link the chains together. So we have the length of each chain defined up here as h. So then we're basically saying delta x squared plus delta y squared has to be less than or equal to h squared, which means that the distance between each point cannot be more than the length of an individual chain link. And then we solve the model here. So the solving here for 100 points doesn't take too long. Uh, let's run it in the background here. Oh, 
But the time complexity of these problems becomes uh, really bad as you start to increase the numbers. So this is another area that can take a whole presentation, is talking about the time complexities of these different types of problems. But basically, as we have 100 links here, I ran it and it takes something like 30 seconds to solve, which is fine. When you do 1,000, it takes a really long time. And I never got 10,000 to finish before I came here to present. So, <laughs> so when did you start running? This morning. OK. I think yeah. we're all patient enough just to sit around and wait for 10,000. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other issue becomes that some of these algorithms are not multi threaded, so you can't run them in parallel. And a lot of modern computers are multi core. And if you're booting up something like a VM through Amazon Web Services or something, when you pay for a larger VM, you get more cores rather than sing faster individual single cores. So some of these nonlinear algorithms that are not parallel can become really difficult to scale because you can't throw it on a faster computer. You just get more cores that they can't use. So we get the optimal solution. Right now it's generating our graph. But basically right down here I use the uh, library that I imported up top, which is gadfly. And then we're basically creating an SVG of the x and y values. So down here you can use get value to retrieve the value for uh, an optimized model. So we're going through for every single x y coordinate and pooling the value. Uh, the data structure that it comes out as is a little weird, so I push it into a float array. And then basically plot it and create the SVG, catenary.svg. So hopefully that worked. And I think we can just go back to Chrome because I have a finished image there. But this is what it comes out as. So it minimizes the potential energy. And so basically, each of these points represents an intersection between two chains. And so now we have the classic catenary, which you can solve by hand. It will come out as a hyperbolic cosine of a specific weight. But uh, this is a lot faster than solving it by hand. Uh, so this is the classic catenary, then. So that should be most of the presentation. We went through four things. We looked at optimization and operations research, including how it applies to physics. We looked at Julia and Jump and why they're interesting. And we looked at two applications. So if you have any questions, please shoot me an email. The example problems are online on github.com slash staffjoy. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. some of these variables, we just had to specify that they were integers. But then you had that array there that you specifically you know, said float 64 for 64. Yeah. You know, so I guess I'm a, I'm a little confused. How aware would I need to be as a user of exactly what kind of precision I need in, in these sorts of things? So this is kind of the Achilles heel of jump, is you don't get to use a lot of the cool features of Julia because it calls these C-based backends that are compiled. So basically, when we're defining these data types up here, they're going to get converted to C data types, which have basically been standardized for these interfaces. So if you look at the C-based backends, it's possible that if you use their native APIs, you could have some more specific data types. But here, we're basically constrained to these three data types for decision variables just because of the way the jump was designed. So now at the end here, uh, I don't think that there's actually a standard float in Julia. I think you have to specify float 32 or float 64. So this was just a little bit arbitrary. But yeah, that's the difficult part, is you don't get to use Julia's typing when you're actually solving the problem. So it gets pushed to the compiled solvers that are typically not written in Julia. So it, it, if it was the reverse, if you were getting uh, the results from um, the, those compiled libraries, Julia could then infer the type yeah. uh, for you. But the point is here, uh, the, those libraries are expecting Types as inputs. So this is uh, also where the heuristics can come into play. So if you're doing really complex heuristics in Julia, then you can use the type systems that are built into Julia before you send it to Jump. All right. Well, let's thank Phil again for his talk.